Hi everyone. Welcome back to my journey with chronic Lyme disease. My last video left off with my diagnosis of Lyme after being chronically ill for about 13 months with lots of ups and downs. And prior to that, about five years of these weird episodes where I would black out and vomit and they just didn't know what was wrong with me. So it was chronic Lyme. Once I was correctly diagnosed, I was placed on four weeks of doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, and I started to feel a little bit better, but not much better. I still had symptoms of tiredness, a sore throat, swollen glands, weakness, just general fatigue and headaches. But as the weather started getting a bit better, I started feeling better as well. And this is a pattern that we noticed that each sort of springtime, I would begin to feel better. And each fall, October, November, I would start to decline. So this is now spring of 2011. I was 18, still living in New York. I was doing some freelance modeling as well as finishing my second semester at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And I started going out to clubs again drinking, lots of late nights, so not exactly taking care of myself. In April, I moved into an apartment that was filled with models. I got free rent, but I did have to go out to clubs a minimum amount of nights per week. Essentially, celebrities aren't as cool as you think they are, and when they go out, they need pretty young models surrounding them so that they look cool. Um, so this is the case for many different celebrities as well as you know club owners they just want to look like they're just followed around by pretty people all the time so we got free dinners at all the top restaurants free drinks trips to the hamptons on the weekend we'd be staying at these mansions obviously access to all the high-end clubs and it was amazing i had an incredible time, especially living for free. I didn't have to pay for anything. I had one of the best summers of my life. In August, I started dating someone pretty seriously and it would become a long-term relationship. So I did slow down a little bit with the clubbing and I only went out the minimum amount of nights uh, per week in order to still get my free rent. And I also had school starting back up again and I was taking 18 credits over the semester. So I was starting to slow down in one sense, but not in others. <laughs> By October, I started to decline again. My symptoms at this point were fatigue, which never went away, joint pain, night sweats. I would wake up just absolutely covered in sweat. I was weak, my balance was a bit off, and I also had brain fog. So my brain was just like, <laughs> still there. <laughs> um, it was almost like a, a cloud was there. I had trouble finding the words that I wanted. And it was just like you could see the cogs, you know, rolling each time that I wanted to say anything. So I decided to go up to Maine to see my parents while I had a break from school in October. And I saw my primary care physician from when I was 17. And he put me on another three weeks of antibiotics. Unfortunately, there wasn't much change. In November, I finally moved out of that model apartment and I moved into an apartment in Brooklyn on my own. My symptoms, however, did continue to worsen. I suddenly couldn't stand for more than a few minutes without getting incredibly dizzy, which was certainly a problem on the subway. I'm not, you know, the, the typical person that they would stand up for and give a seat to. I was 19 at this point and looked perfectly fine. And so I'd be on the subway, I'd get very dizzy, and then I'd get covered in sweat, and I'd either vomit or I'd black out. It actually got to the point where each time I had to get on the subway, I would bring a plastic bag with me that I could be sick into. My joint pain also got worse. I began having tremors in my hands pretty consistently. I was having tingling and numbness across my body at one point one whole side of my body just felt almost numb and it didn't last a long time, but it was obviously very scary. I would also get these sort of sharp pains where it felt like something bit me. So I'd you know quickly look and there was nothing there. And also when I was overtired or I overdid it, I would actually have trouble walking. A family friend, Sherry, who was also suffering with chronic Lyme, recommended the Lyme doctor that she was seeing at the time, who was located in Pauling, New York, 
Dr. Kenneth Legner. We made an appointment with Dr. Legner, which started with a phone consultation and then we were able to have our first in-person initial consultation in February 2012. Had to put my hair up, England is much sunnier and warmer than you would think. Dr. Legner did not take insurance and he was not cheap, but at this point we were desperate to get some help. I was incredibly fortunate to have my parents be so financially supportive as well as with me every step of the way as we tried to figure out what was wrong with me as well as how to make me better. So thank you so much to my wonderful mom and dad as well as the rest of my family too. I understand not everyone has this support and I'm so grateful that I was lucky enough to have this. So we met with Dr. Legner in person in February 2012 and actually on our first visit he did let us know about a colleague of his located in Albion, Maine which is not far from where I grew up but at the time um, we wanted to continue going to Dr. Legner because he was a world-renowned Lyme researcher and pioneer and he was who we thought was the best at the time. Dr. Legner was incredibly thorough. He did every test under the sun to see the entire scope of what we were dealing with. He did more blood tests, he did physical exams as well, and he really seemed to know what he was doing. One test in particular that I remember, but he had also written on his consultation notes because he was so shocked, was a test on my strength. And I remember he had me put both of my arms out and he would put his hand either above or below and I had to either push up or down. And he actually questioned how, how much I was actually trying because I could barely move either way and my hands were shaking so much. And he just couldn't believe how weak I was as a 19 year old girl, formerly very active. And I, I really struggled even just to, to move just slightly. So based on just my, uh, the physical exam, as well as the symptoms that I had listed and that he had physically seen himself, Dr. Liegner was convinced that I had more than just chronic Lyme disease, but also that I would have other tick diseases. And he felt pretty strongly, although it was only speculation, that my diagnosis of Epstein-Barr virus the year before uh, was incorrect. It was then decided that I would start my first course of long-term antibiotics. It had been mentioned that IV antibiotics was an option, but at the time we just wanted to start orally and see how I would tolerate it. So I was placed on amoxicillin, a quite high dosage, and then I would increase each week to see how my body um, handled it, essentially. I went back one month later to see Liegner and he had then received the test results back that confirmed that I did have another tick-borne illness, which was babesiosis. So we began treating for that with malarone, which is a anti-malaria drug. As I was handling the amoxicillin fine, although I didn't have any change in my symptoms, but at least my body was tolerating it. So we also added in um, minocycline as a secondary antibiotic as well. Unfortunately, the minocycline did give me migraines really badly. Um, so we swapped that out for doxycycline. So at this point, I'm still going to school at the Fashion Institute of Technology, and I was still doing some freelance modeling work. As the weather started to improve, I did feel slightly better, more in the way that I would have more okay days rather than terrible days, but I wasn't really having any good days. I still couldn't really stand on the subway for more than a few minutes without blacking out which was really annoying. Um, so we decided that I would do a course of IV antibiotics that coming May. However, I don't like to make things easy on myself. So in April, I was actually scouted to be on the first season of a modeling reality competition show called The Face. But at the same time, I was also applying to um, all the top agencies in New York to become a full-time professional model. One of the agencies invited me to come in for a meeting and they actually offered me a contract on that day. Aware that the following month I was due to go up to Maine for IV treatment, I was upfront with the agency and I actually told the director that I had been suffering from Lyme disease, but I just needed to go do this one month of treatment and then I'd be able to return after fully fit and able to work 
and this was not questioned by them. So I signed the contract and let FIT know that I would be deferring my next year of school. I returned home to Maine at the end of May and was very determined that this was the treatment that was gonna absolutely fix me and I'd be fine in one month's time. So for this treatment, I was going to be receiving IV Recephin, which is an antibiotic, and I needed to go into the hospital each day for about an hour to receive the infusion. But when we first started it, they were pricking me in my hand, and so then I'd have this little sort of IV in my hand for a few days, then they'd take it out, and then they put a new one in but um, one, it really hurt. <laughs> my hand was like black and blue. And two, they were actually having trouble finding the vein. So it was decided that I would get a pick line, which is essentially a tube that they put into my arm and it goes straight up into my heart. So it's, it's easier access and they don't have to keep pricking me because it just stays in my arm. So this made life a little easier. I still have my little scar there, although it was really sore that first week. Don't let them tell you it doesn't hurt, it hurts. Actually getting the treatment wasn't bad at all. I'd go into the infusion clinic. The only sort of weird thing about it was um, it would actually make my whole body cold, mostly because the bag of fluid was cold. So as it went into you, you could slowly feel it like going over your body and making all of your veins freezing. <laughs> but I got to know the regular nurses. My favorites were Helen, Trish, and Julia. Hi guys. And I also had an infusion buddy, Paul, I hope you're feeling good. Um, he would be there with me most days sitting across the room and we'd have little chats. And if Paul wasn't there, I'd be watching Bravo on a little mini TV. So it really wasn't that bad. I felt maybe a little bit better at the end of it. I probably could have done with a little bit more treatment, but insurance actually only covered four weeks. So that's what I got. Plus, I had probably convinced myself that I was feeling better than I was because I was about to return back to my home city and begin my dream job. So I went back to New York and I moved into my boyfriend's apartment and began going on castings and started working quite quickly. I quickly found out that the modeling industry is bittersweet. I really enjoyed working, especially if it was a photo shoot but what they don't tell you is that most days you're running around on castings and so you're just literally going to about 10 different places throughout the city, going, waiting in a line, seeing someone for about 30 seconds where you give them your card, maybe do a little walk in front of them and then you're on your way. It was a lot of really long days, a lot of standing, which I had improved at, but it still wasn't great. I wouldn't receive my schedule for the following day until 10 o'clock the night before, which 10 o'clock was actually way past my bedtime because I needed about 11 hours to be functional the next day. And then there would be those terrifying days where you had to actually go into your agency and they would just pick you apart for what you had booked, what you hadn't booked, what you were wearing, how you were portraying yourself. It was just stressful. I remember one time before fashion week, which by the way is like, the most busy and stressful month of your life as a model. My agency was doing a casting of their own with the girls that are already signed with them. Basically, you would try to get into their fashion week package. If you were in the package, it would mean that they would send you out to all the top casting agencies to try to get into the top shows. If you weren't in the package, you would just kind of go to like the bad shows. So you had to parade around the room with your best walk. There was like a huge table in the center of the room with 20 people just staring at you. And I was wearing this really pretty tight fitted um, like peplum style top with a leather trim and it looked really cool with some black shorts and tights. And after I made it into the package, which was great. And my booker said, you look amazing today. You need to wear this to every casting, wear that every day, look like this. So the next day I did what I was told. I went to castings wearing exactly that outfit. And then I was called into my agency. One of the casting directors said they really liked me, but that I wasn't edgy enough and that what I was wearing was all wrong. My booker said to me, I am never to wear that peplum top again and I need to stop being so pretty. So this is just an example of why it was just emotionally stressful as a job, but also physically with all the standing and running around the city and um, it just was not great. But on the other hand, it did pay pretty well 
and through all the sort of crappy jobs every now and then you get a really good one I got my first campaign for David's bridal I think my first month in working so that was really fun and you know the big brands you're really well taken care of if it's for something big thankfully with the exception of one time where I got really sweaty and vomited and blacked out but the client just thought that it was typical model behavior and I hadn't been eating. Um, otherwise, I was always able to look good, complete my full day, my full job, and the client would never know that I was actually really sick. I would then go home and completely crash. My symptoms would just completely engulf me and I would be bed bound until I needed to get up again. Weeknights, weekends, I didn't do anything except sleep because I wanted to be able to work. We're now in early 2013 and my symptoms at this point are fatigue, which never goes away, the muscle and joint pain, I would still have my brain fog, I would get the tingling and numbness, I had tremors in my hands, night sweats, headaches, difficulty walking when I overdid it, sore throat, swollen glands, and then I started getting these strange rashes. It just came on completely suddenly. I all of a sudden noticed that I had some red dots on the back of me. So I turned toward the mirror and my entire back was just covered in these little red dots. They then spread to my chest and it lasted about two months. I then later on had what looked like ringworm. I had this big red rash around my neck that was itchy and would burn. Um, but this is apparently a symptom of babesiosis. Babes babesiosis is known for giving weird, odd, untreatable rashes. In May 2013, just under a year of modeling full-time, I was being sent to Milan, Italy for approximately two to three months to work. And although I wasn't feeling great and my parents and my boyfriend strongly urged me not to go, I was very determined. Even though I had only just fainted on Easter at my brother's house a few weeks before, I didn't want to not live my life. I didn't want this disease to take another thing from me, another opportunity, another dream. So I went. The reason I'm getting so emotional is, well, there's a lot of reasons, but um, I think just because I felt like this was so unfair. I hadn't felt like I had done anything to deserve this. Not that anyone deserves to, you know, be chronically ill, but also I was 20. I was 20 years old and I just felt like my friends were all carefree and able to do everything that they wanted and you know no dream was too big for them there was nothing holding them back and why why was there something that had to hold me back and also I'm also emotional because I know that I did all of these things that made me worse but at the time I felt that it's what I needed to do to actually want to live. I needed to have a life. I needed to do things that would make me happy. And um, although it made me sick for an even longer time, I am glad that I went through and I had those experiences and I lived my life. I am very sorry to my family and my friends who were constantly worried about me because I, you know, needed to still do these things for myself. And I know that's very selfish, but um, I needed to. Let me get my emotional support animal. Here she is. Make me stop crying. Okay, Milan. Um, Milan was the first time I had ever traveled to another country on my own, so that was a bit daunting. And when I got there, I was put into a model apartment that had five or six models living there in a studio apartment meant for about two people. Throughout my time there, I was mostly going to castings, but I did get a few jobs. At the end of the day, again, I would just completely crash. I'd go back to my little tiny bunk bed and I would just watch DVDs or FaceTime with my boyfriend or my family or friends and, uh, you know, just eat. I would eat lots of chocolate and pizza and pasta. The food was actually really good, um, but I did gain a bit of weight. 
after about five weeks there, I was then requested for a job in New York. So I was flown back. While I was in New York, I was then requested for a job in Milan that would also then take me to Paris. So I worked every day in New York until my flight. I then worked all those days in Milan and then they flew me to Paris and then I flew back to New York and worked again. So in total, I worked about 34 days straight with the exception of one or two of those days in there where I had to fly internationally. I pushed through it, I did it, but it actually really killed me and threw me over the edge. Again, I was really unwell. I was having the excruciating joint pain, muscle pain, stiffness of the joints, my consistent, consistent headaches, migraines here and there as well, chest pains just here consistently. I was having some heart palpitations, shortness of breath, weakness, muscle twitching, numbness, the pins and needles, the little biting feeling where there was nothing actually biting me there. I was having night sweats and also some day sweats, dizziness, poor balance, confusion, difficulty walking when I overdid it, buzzing and ringing in my ears, tremors, confusion, difficulty thinking, forgetfulness, sensitivity to light and sound, sometimes difficulty with my speech. I would also sometimes see things in the corner of my eye, um, like little floaters almost. In November, I went into my agency and I spoke to them about my symptoms and how much I had been suffering because I hadn't let them know about any of it uh, since I had had that treatment before I started with them about a year and a half before that. I told them that I would be going up to Maine for Thanksgiving and that I would stay there until at least early January to seek additional Lyme treatment again. So I went home and we made an appointment with that colleague of Dr. Liegner's who is located in Maine, Dr. Dubach. I'm gonna stop the video here today. I'm a little bit emotionally spent, um, but I do want to say that there is hope because I do get better and uh, it's mostly due to Dr. Dubach as well as some lifestyle changes that I make at his recommendation. So I'm gonna go pick myself back up and lift my spirits, probably by singing really badly <laughs> uh, to pop songs and dancing around my living room because I can now do that and I am grateful that I can. So thank you and I'll see you all soon. Bye.